Yeah, I, I served as a lieutenant and went up to the ranks. Uh, I retired a few years back as a battalion chief. Um, let me first start by saying that I do not hold a PhD in psychology. Um, I'm not an expert as far as taking a tip, typical educational format to get here. Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about is some of the experiences that I've gone through in life um, based on my career path. Um, you know, you spent 30 years in the fire service um, as well as uh, on a federal urban search and rescue team. So I've been all over the country, all over the world, the World Trade Center, um, uh, Mississippi during Hurricane Katrina, uh, Haiti um, following the earthquake. Uh, so I've got to see the best and worst of humanity. So that's kind of my life background. Um, but what I hope to do today is kind of influence you people a little bit um, because I know that you're going to be going into studying personal development or career path development or whatever. And maybe I can offer you some do's and don'ts, so to speak, um, as far as, you know, getting to where you want to be. Um, for example, how many people here had a piggy bank when they were young? Don't be embarrassed to put your hand up. Just about everybody, right? Okay. And when you got that piggy bank, what did you do with it? How many people actually put money in it? How many people actually accumulated money in it? How much did you have in it? Over $300. And then someone took it from me. <laughs> oh, wait. Stole it? He borrowed it. Yeah, but he never paid me back. Never paid you back. I'm sure he needed it for a good reason, right? So you actually accumulated three hundred dollars, right? How old were you when you started that? When I started, it was like it was like uh, I turned eight, and then I was about twelve, and that's how much I had. So from eight to twelve, you accumulated three hundred bucks. Can I have your spare change? Yeah, so. Right. So that was your first attempt at success, right? And you made it. Yeah, and then it's got taken from me. That's the unfortunate part about it. <clears throat> but you filled it. Did anybody else fill their piggy bank? Nobody? No? You totally filled one? Yeah. How many people are still filling one? Yeah. Where's it going? Huh? To the kids' account? Yeah, yeah. To the kids' account. House, okay. Car, insurance. House, car, insurance, food, right? But see, that basically is our first attempt at success without even knowing it. You know, your parents give you this thing or you get it as a gift, whatever, and you get a piggy bank and you get wowed by it and you get motivated and you get inspired and you want to say, I'm going to fill this piggy bank. Okay? And... For some of us, it lasts a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. And then from some others, it may go on a lifetime and, you know, we accumulate quite a bit of money. But that's the start of success at an early age. And as we grow, you know, we get into different things and now we're in college and we're thinking about our career path development or where we want to be or, you know, what success is to us, okay? So, what, what is success to you? Where do you want to be? Oh, I stopped thinking that far ahead. <laughs> right. No, I've already, I've already done life twice, so. I'm yeah. I'm not even that far ahead anymore, man. No? <laughs> okay, that's a good I've point. Try, I've tried to. That's a I good had point. Plans 20, 30 years out, and now I'm not even going to a year. 
Yeah. That's a good point because, see, we have a bad habit of projection. We, we think way, way down the road instead of the first three feet in front of us. For example, let's say that you had to climb a mountain. Does anybody see these people that climb a mountain without a rope? They just scale it. Ever see pictures of that? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, this person might be, I don't know, a couple of three, four, five hundred feet up on a mountain on a rock ledge, hand by hand, foot by foot. And where do you think they're looking? The, the next step. The next step. Exactly. They're, they're, they're calculating every move. You know, if I put my hand here, where's it going to bring me? If I put my foot there, where's it going to do for me? So they concentrate on just the three feet in front of them. They don't look down and they don't look up. You know, as a firefighter over the years, Climbed many ladders, hung off of many ropes. And we had this thing in the fire service where we never said we were scared. We would say that we're a little bit apprehensive. You know? That was a term that I used to use when I would teach other guys. Don't ever say you're scared. Just say you're a little apprehensive. But, you know, I would try to tell people, you know, don't look. If you're climbing 110 feet to the top, and when you get to the top, don't look down. Just look at that three feet in front of you because that tells you where your next step is. See, in life, we spend way too much time thinking about where we want to go, what we want to do, who we want to be, than actually doing it. Am I correct in saying that? How many people here have a strategic plan for where they want to be? No hands go up. <laughs> you do? Yeah. What's your strategic plan? As far as what? Like what part of where you want to be? Who you? Schooling or anything? In life in general? I mean, I have like, I don't want to go all the way to school. I want to get my doctorate and so PhD. Mm -hmm. It's a long, like, you know. Mm -hmm. But don't look down that way. Just look no, at the three feet from Yeah. Semester right. I take it week by week, assignment by assignment, like yep. break it down by like I just gotta get through this assignment. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. if I think too but I took like I'm a little bit older, I took a, a yeah. lot of bumps for me to figure that out. Yeah. I too much anxiety when I start thinking about, you know, big, you know, scientific experiments and stuff like that. Like, yeah. you know, I'm just gonna try and write this paper. Gets overwhelmed, right? Yeah. So let's just think about the paper, let's think about the next assignment. And it helps you get through it, correct? So, yeah. so you have a strategic plan to get to a particular but I'm also place. Flexible, and I know, like through other like spirituality and stuff, that sometimes my plan is not the same as God's plan for me. So things change, things happen. You got to be flexible because you never know what's going to happen. If my husband can't work, I might have to stop going to school for a minute and take care of what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So things always happen in life. Yeah. Some things just happen, some things we bring upon ourselves, too. Okay? You know, we interfere our own path, so to speak. But when you think about it, we're all trying to achieve some type of goal. We're all trying to get somewhere in life. That's why we're here. That's why we're getting an education. We're trying to. But none of us really think about a strategic plan. All we're thinking about is the overwhelming process about what it is we're trying to do. It's too much thought. And we get overwhelmed. And then what do we do when we get overwhelmed? We get afraid. What else do we start to do? Apprehensive. Apprehensive. <laughs> okay. Make mistakes. What about the word excuses? Oh, yeah. Right? 
How many of us are putting an ex excuse to something that we're trying to achieve? You know, you look out the window and it's pouring rain and out or it's snowing like crazy and we had enough of that this year, believe me. I think we're all tired of the white stuff. So we look out the window and we already started the fetus attitude within our plan because we say, oh my God, it's snowing out. Oh, what a terrible day I'm going to have today. But why is it going to be a bad day because it's snowing? Why does it have to be a bad day because it's raining? Why can't it be a good day? Give me a reason why it can't be a good day. It might be, right, yeah. So it runs a little interference, but can't you switch gears and do something else and accomplish something and get something done? Yeah, I'm going to ride my bike through here. Won't stop anyway. yeah. <laughs> hey, man, that's... You know what that is? That's power. That's determination. That's attitude. That's discipline on her shirt. See, I get up in the morning. If my eyes wake up, and I go into the bathroom, and I move my bowels, guess what? It's a good day. It's a good day. <laughs> no doubt about it. I'm 53 years old. And if I wake up, and I can go into the bathroom and have success, <laughs> It will be a good day. Now, I know you don't think about that at your age, but I do. And then just this, this morning, I opened up the mail. All right, and get this. I open up the mail. And this funny looking envelope. And I get this thing. A-A-R-P. Talk about adding insult to injury. They already want to put me there. <laughs> I think I'm a pretty hip guy at 53. I, you know what I mean? I have eight stents in my heart. 41 operations. I still get up and work every day. I'm still doing it. And they send me this. They want to put me out the pasture already. <laughs> and they're going to send me a free gift. <laughs> a bag. Like a backpack. And I said, good, so I could carry my medications around, right? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. It's a discount. But, <clears throat> but there's always a gimmick that, you know, they sent me the card free and I get the backpack free if I pay the $16.99 for the magazine. I don't want no, no magazine, uh, you know, telling me that I'm already old and I'm going to get older. I mean, I, I, I can tell you that. I mean, I got to get in the shower for a good 45 minutes just to straighten up in the morning. It's life. You see, I wrote a book that just talks about everyday life. You know, if I was a Navy SEAL, and I love them guys, and I love all service people, they're doing great things. If I was a Navy SEAL and I wrote that book, guess what I would be? I wouldn't be here, it'd be a million dollars. You know, I would, I would probably have a national audience. <clears throat> But I wrote a book about my life experiences and what I did to turn them things around. See, I, I was in a, an occupation that I loved for 30 years. I never went to work and worked. I loved what I did. I had a lot of passion for what I did. And wherever you're going in life, whatever your career path is, whatever you're using to develop to get to where you want to be, the most important thing to me is that you have passion 
for what it is you want to do. Because if you have passion, you'll have desire, you'll have belief in yourself, and you will get to where you want to be. So if I asked you a question and I said, let's say all jobs paid the same. It doesn't matter what you do, every, every job pays the same. What would you do? What would you do to make the world a better place? I'd be an You'd be an elementary school teacher. Why? I feel like I like kids and I feel like shaping their minds. Shaping their minds, which is a great thing. You know, I have tremendous admiration for educators because if it wasn't for educators, I wouldn't be where I am today. Okay? So that's great. You know, some people say, I want to be a CEO of a big company because it pays six figures. But they may hate that job. Yeah. Right? Think back for a second. When was the last time you enjoyed or you were happy where you were? Think of some theme or some activity or some place in, in life where you were truly happy. Can anybody answer that? 2006, 2009, I was in he was in the army station in Germany. And why? I loved everything about it. Loved everything about it. I loved waking up. I liked working for a week straight, no sleep. I enjoyed every bit of it. I was a mechanic, so I always had something to do. So money didn't make no, no matter, didn't right? It didn't matter then. I mean, you know, I was living in the barracks, and they, they fed me. You know, I just... But you loved what you were doing. Oh, I loved it, absolutely. Okay, you loved what you were doing. That was your, was your happy place at yeah. the moment, okay? Now, something altered that? I'd say so. I'm sorry? I'd say so, yes. Okay. Somebody else, you. Well, I'm happy now, where are you? You're happy now? Wait, why are you happy? Because you're in school? Or? Uh, well, I'm a bartender, so I get to meet new people every day. Um, I have regulars that come see me every day. <laughs> so you, you find you're talking to a lot of fascinating people, right? You're yeah, interacting, so... It's flexible. Where was your happy place? A uh, half hour ago in the classroom. Like you, I'm fortunate. I, I do what I'm passionate about. Exactly, right? So coming to work doesn't mean nothing. The money that's, I mean, superficially, but you come here because that's your passion and you love what you do. So it's not work. But it's when I'm getting here to elevate because I work with everybody. And I see that smile on your face and the same thing. You did a great job on me. It just brings my joy and I find that I can do something with that. Beautiful. How about you in the back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, last night I was playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know? I walked into the firehouse one day, and we're all at the coffee table, which is always the focal point in the firehouse. And they all got their laptops on. And we didn't have iPads back then. And they all on, you know, they're doing their gaming thing, farm aid or whatever. You know, I snuck in and I looked. You know, it was football season, so they're doing their fantasy football thing, right? It's 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm supposed to be doing something else. So I snuck in and I looked, and all nine guys sitting at the table, not interacting, they were all on their laptops or their cell phones or whatever. And I snuck through the back of the firehouse and I went into the boiler room where the electric panel is, <laughs> and I flipped the switch for that room and I looked out. And guys are going, huh? <laughs> what just happened? Their whole life just stopped right then and there. Their will came to a complete end. 
over fantasy football, over a game. Now, I'm not knocking what it is you do that brings enjoyment, but where's that going to get you? Think about it. Being happy and developing that happy spot and thinking about what, what it is you want to do and staying focused and having that strategic plan in your personal development process will allow you to get there. But if you're miserable at doing what it is you're doing, what's the sense, right? You see, when I was about six or seven years old, I saw this big red truck, and it's in my book. And you know, I had a fascination for f trucks and fire trucks or whatever, but I saw this truck being built. I didn't know what it was at the time. But as the production progressed, I realized that this was a, a big fire truck, unique one, didn't know what type of fire truck, or it didn't have ladders on and a hose, it was different. It was a heavy rescue truck, and it was being built for the city of New York. And at that time, I became fascinated with it. And I said to myself, I want to be a firefighter. So that was my happy place, and that's how it started. And I progressed with that. And I pursued that. And then, at 18 years old, my world came to a shuddering halt. As a volunteer firefighter, I was climbing an aerial ladder. And we are at a mill, an old vacant mill. And we had a lot of them back then. And it was commonplace to practice at these mills, to get familiar with them, you know, do evolutions in it. So anyway, climbing up this aerial ladder, and there was a crew ahead of us, and they're stretching the hose line up. And in the process, one of the couplings, the hose coupling, gets snagged. So I reached down and realized that there was a problem. And I tried to signal the people ahead of me by raising my hand. And when I did that, 14,000 volts of a 35,000 volt transmission line went through my body. And it burned my hands to the bone, exited my right leg. And I spent just about five months in the hospital. All right. Two of them months, I had one hand sewn into my stomach. I'm going to think about this for a second. I came. Well, how it started was a doctor came in. And he says, John, we're going to take you down to, to the operating room tomorrow, and we're going to do this thing called an abdominal flop. You know, and I was 18 years old, you know, all John Wayne about it. Yeah, all right, Doc, whatever you're going to do. And he told me, he says, if we can't do this, we're going to probably have to amputate your arm from just below the shoulder to the elbow on the shoulder. And I said, oh, okay, whatever. I'm good. So I go down to the operating room, and I wake up, I don't know, maybe 11, 12 hours later in my room. It was a weekend. <clears throat> and when I woke up, I was all taped up. And I was in this thing called a striker frame. And, and for those of you who don't know what a striker frame is, it's sort of like a rotisserie kind of thing. It's a bed that has a frame with like a mesh. And it has two sides, a top and a bottom. And it's designed so you lay flat in it, you lay still. Um, they use it for different things. People have cervical neck fractures and things like that. And, you know, they'll rotate it every so many hours so you don't get bed sores, okay? So anyway, I wake up in this striker frame, and, you know, and nurses are coming in, and, you know, they're attending to me, but they're not saying nothing, and my family's coming in, and they're not saying nothing. And then it hits me. I said, they cut my arm off. because I couldn't see it. 
So at the time, all these emotions, see, I was too afraid to ask. I didn't want to know the answer. I wanted to know the answer, but I didn't want to know the answer because if it wasn't the answer I wanted, it was going to have consequences and ramifications and it was going to alter everything that I had planned for my career path, my development. So I'm laying there, it's over the weekend, and then finally on Monday morning, the doctor comes in. He went skiing. He went skiing. Probably because the operation cost somewhere around $45,000. So he was ahead of the game. So he went and enjoyed himself. And then he comes in Monday morning. Must have just came off the sleigh. He had actually a down vest on. And he would have never known he was a doctor. Comes into the room. Gets a nurse, uh, you know, asks for this, that, and the other thing. They bring a tray in. And then he starts cutting the bandaging on the right side of my body over here. And I said to myself, oh, God, I'm going to see it. So for almost three days, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I laid in bed with the thought that they had amputated my arm from just below the shoulder. So then he starts with this instrument, he starts digging in the side of this bandaging and he starts pulling out all this pussy, bloody gauze. It stunk like hell. And he starts digging in there with like these forcep kind of things and he's yanking and I can feel him yanking on it. And I'm saying, what is he doing? Then all of a sudden, he gives a good pull and out came a finger. Oh and I said, oh, I'm very confused here. <laughs> and then he digs in some more, and he pulls out another finger. And he dug in some more, and he pulled out a third finger. And then he squeezed the fingertips, and he said, oh, the color looks good. Very happy with it. Off he went. That's all he said. <laughs> 18 years old. So now the nurses come back in, and now it's their job to repackage me. <clears throat> so I turned over to the nurse and I said, so like, what's going on? Oh, the doctor said, Dr. Sturm, very famous hand surgeon at the time, probably one of the best in the state. When I first met him, I hated him, had the worst bedside manner. We became good friends. <clears throat> Long and short of it, they had cut my abdomen open, pulled my stomach down, basically the, you know, the whole layer of skin, right down to your abdominal wall, put my hand in my stomach, brought the skin up, sewed it to one side, took this part, sewed it to here. And they were trying to save the limb. That was a process at the time. I didn't know anything about it, but the nurses ended up explaining it to me. So that was a good thing. So I still had my arm. Only thing that was attached to my abdomen. Sucky part about all that was I couldn't get up for 30 days. I had to lay in this striker frame thing. All right? Now, when you're in the hospital in a condition like this here, you're getting all kinds of meds. And meds will do different things. They'll either make you constipated or they'll make you go too much. So my big question for the day was, how do I go to the bathroom? Well, you're going to go to the bathroom right there. You're going to bring a bedpan in. So add insult to injury again. You think about humiliation. You know, you have people coming in, and you're in this funny-looking bed thing, and somebody's holding a pan underneath you. You know, there's a little access hole for everything to happen, you know? 
<clears throat> and usually the people that come in to do these kind of things is not somebody you know. Could be somebody studying to be a nurse right out of this college at the time, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and that's how I went to the bathroom for 30 days. And if I was in the inverted position and I was sick to my stomach and I vomited, I was about eight inches off the floor. So guess what? Now you gotta imagine, this arm's sewn to my stomach, this arm's completely bandaged over to my side. You know, I don't know if anybody says I've ever been in the hospital, they have a little button you push, right? Call the nurse. I couldn't push the button. So I'd have to lay in that and look and smell my own vomit. So that was what happened to me when I was 18. That's the short version of it. There's a lot more to that story, and it's in the book. But anyway, <clears throat> when my hand was finally released from my stomach, and then they decided that the right hand had the same process. They kind of attached it to my hip, and I went through that process for 30 days. A few months go by, get out of the hospital with this uncertain future. See, life can change in an instant. Or, in an instant, you can change your life. So back then, I was being told by Dr. Stern, like I said, I didn't like this guy in the beginning. Because I told him, you know, I want to be a firefighter. That's where I want to be. It's my passion. It's what I want to do. You know, and he was a very straightforward kind of guy. And he said, you'll never climb a ladder and you will never swing from ropes. Put that idea right out of your head. Even if I can save your arm, it's going to be totally useless. You burnt out your medium and all the nerve. All the tendons in your hand are destroyed. You know, even in the best that I can do with today's medical technology and what I can do as a hand surgeon, you're probably not going to have a functional hand. And then again, you get the whole problem with your right hand, with your thumb. All the joint capsules burned away. We don't even know if we can save your thumb. And if you lose your thumb, you pretty much don't have a hand because you don't have, if you can't oppose your thumb, your hand's useless. <clears throat> Sunday afternoon, program called Wide World of Sports. You people wouldn't remember that. I don't know you guys might remember that. Remember Wide World of Sports? And here is this gymnast with one arm performing on the uneven parallel bars. Everybody know what the uneven parallel bars are? And she's swinging and she's doing all her trapeze type act or whatever with one arm. And at that moment, I said to myself, if she can do that with one arm, then there's nothing that I can't do with whatever I'm left with after I leave this hospital. So right then and there, my whole mindset, my whole method of thinking changed. And I said to myself, I will never say that I'm handicapped. I will only say that I'm a little inconvenienced. A year and a half later, after all them operations in between, I got back on a fire truck, and there was a lot of reluctance, a lot of apprehension, not from me, the people I was working with. You know, they were saying, like, can this kid do this? You know, in, in firefighting, you know, we have to depend on each other, just like soldiers in combat. You've you got to have the ability, not only mentally, physically, to be able to do these kind of things. So I had that problem to overcome. And then I had the fire chief who thought I was a liability. <clears throat> In his mind, I shouldn't be stepping back on a fire truck. <clears throat> but 
But anyway, long and short of the story was I was determined to overcome it, put the process in motion, okay, and eventually I got through it and spent 30 years in the fire service in a job that I loved. Part of the problem was many years later, I'm in constant chronic pain, so doctors are feeding me medication. They give you narcotic pain pills. And what do you think happens with that? So I became dependent on these things. So now I have another problem that I got to overcome. Okay, I went from being totally normal, working hard, to having this dependency to narcotic painkillers. And understand this, it was easy. It's not like I was the type of person that had to go, had to go seek drugs on the street. It wasn't that kind of habit, but it's still, you know, one addiction is no different than another. I would go to one doctor who was treating me for one thing, and he would write me on a prescription and go to another doctor, treat me for something, he'd give me a prescription. So he never had a shortage of this medication. It was always coming in. But, you know, I was taking too many. And in my mind, I thought I needed it, but it created a problem. And before I knew it, it was taking the best of me. So it interrupted my life, so to speak. So, again, there's things in life that you know, we aspire to do and we accomplish. And then there's things that we bring on to ourselves. See, that was my choice. You know? No one put a gun to my head. I was taking too many because I chose to take too many. So I'm, you know, what I'm basically saying is I'm standing in front of you here. I'm not perfect. I'm no different than anyone. I'm just as human as all you people. <clears throat> but it's the kind of thing that you don't want to get into. It's just something that was unfortunate. I had to overcome it. <clears throat> Wasn't part of my career path. But I used it. After it was all said and done, I used that to weave in the things that I was doing so I could come out and speak with people that were having similar problems and tell them that they could overcome these issues. I used it to go into classrooms in high schools to talk about drug addiction and alcohol abuse and stuff like that. So I used it to my advantage. So, I can't come here in an hour and tell you all about my life. And I can't come here in an hour and tell you everything it is that you need to do to get to where you want to be. But I can tell you this, that the power is within you to get there. Now, we have people that inspire, we have people that motivate. So if I say to you, what is inspiration? What is inspiration? What happens when you're inspired? Um, you're able to do the things you need to do. How long does it last, though? <laughs> Sometimes it's a short time. Right, so if somebody comes, and talks to you, you get inspired for a few minutes, few hours, few days. Maybe you read a book and it inspires you. <laughs> then you get motivated, you get motivated, right? You get on your bike every day and you traverse quite a bit of territory to get here. So you're motivated, somebody motivated you, maybe you're self-motivated. How long does that last? Not long, right? But it gets you going a little bit more, kind of gets you thinking, makes you do something. So maybe you join the gym, you go to the gym for... But 
we have inspiration, we have motivation. What's the one thing that we lack? So if you go from inspiration to motivation, what comes next? Dedication. Okay, dedication. But let's call that something else. Huh? Termination. Transformation? Termination. Termination, yes. But you have to go from inspiration to transformation. I can come here and talk to you in an hour and I may inspire you, maybe motivate you a little bit, but if I don't transform you, nothing happens. When you get inspired to do something, when you're doing what it is you're trying to do to get to where you want to be, and you're inspired, or you're motivated, and you go to the gym three times a week, it doesn't end there. You got to transform it. Because until you transform, nothing changes. What happens is you fall off. It goes right back to the piggy bank. You start it out, you're inspired, oh, I'm going to fill this thing. Save $300. And then it falls off. See, after you got the $300, you were inspired to do that, you were motivated, you did it, you transformed it. And then when it got empty, what happened? It's done. You didn't start another one, though, right? I was drained. I was all that for nothing. No, you didn't. You didn't do it. Obviously, I don't know the situation, but I mean, if he took it, he must have needed it. Hopefully, he needed something. But what I'm saying is, you got there. The hardest thing in life for me is opening up a Ziploc bag. I go crazy. When I got to open up a Ziploc bag, I just don't have the dexterity to do it. So what do I do? I grab a pair of scissors and cut it in half. You know, drives my wife crazy because now, you know. Okay, so anyway, we're getting short on time. I could talk forever. And there's a lot of talk, talk. I mean, my book is filled with a lot of different things. I'm not here to sell my book. Be nice if you buy my book. <clears throat> Not for the money. It's just for the exposure so I can get the message out. It's all about paying it forward. But I think, what, we got about 15 minutes left? Um, well, I believe there's a class in here at 1 o'clock, and some people have 1 o'clock classes, so they're starting. Okay, this is a little, I, I just want to do a little experiment here, just to, to <laughs> kind of give you a sort of little thought process. <clears throat> Let's take this group of people right here. All right. Let's say that you're on a plane and a plane crashes on a mountain. And you're in a vast wilderness. No idea where you are. What are you going to do? You band together. Find water. We're going to survive as a group. Yeah, survive as a group. Yeah. Okay, keep that thought. And I want you people to evaluate what they're doing. What else are you going to do? Find water. Find water. Build a shelter. You know. Huh? Build a shelter. Build a shelter. Band together. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry. First, I'd make sure everybody's okay, that there's no immediate like emergencies right. going on. People are bleeding, broken. Right, right. <clears throat> so you got to make sure you have some sort of stabilization and tend to that. All right. Okay, so that's all the things that happen immediately. We need to find shelter. We need to get water. We need to get warm. We need to think about, you know, develop a plan. All that stuff is going through your head. Mm -hmm. Your life just got totally altered. In that instant, internally, what are you going to be thinking? I'm going to survive. I'm going to survive. You're going to survive, but take it a step further. I'm going to make it out of here. What else do you think is going on in your head? What do you think is going on in their heads? Huh? Am I ever going back home? Am I ever going to make it back home? How about regrets? You can't focus on that. You what? You can't focus on that. No, exactly. You can't focus on that. Right, but right. Let's get going. Right, let's get going. Let's get going. Right. So, so you you would automatically become the leader of the group. Yeah, I can control issues. Which, yeah. 
<laughs> right. If there's something in you, survival instinct. But what I'm trying to say is, do you see how quick life can change and things need to be refocused and your career path or your developmental path or whatever needs to be reworked? You know, in life there's all these challenges. Every one of us in here can get to where we want to be if we believe that we can get there. The problem is we spend too much time thinking rather than planning. We have too many excuses about why we can't get there so we don't put things into motion. See my friend in the corner? He's not making excuses. Wouldn't it be a lot easier to drive if you had a car? <laughs> but he's getting it. You enjoy riding, but I'm saying is you wouldn't make no. I, I bet you if you if you got a flat tire, you'd carry a bike on your back and you still get here, right? <laughs> Determination, belief, right? You got a great word on your shirt. Babe Ruth gets up. You know how many people know this story? How many? Who does sports fanatics here? Do you ever hear the story about when Babe Ruth did this? What did he do? When he pointed, he was at bats and he pointed, what did he do? Huh? He had a home run. What were the odds of that? Now one of two things happened. Either the pitcher gave him the perfect pitch so he could hit it out of the ballpark or he believed in himself to the point where he says, I'm going to put this ball out of here. But he pointed, swung, and he knocked it out of the park. He's a legend, just for that one moment. When you get up in the morning, your eyes open, start of a good day, go to the bathroom, could be an even better day. <laughs> Look in the mirror, Don't see the same person. Everybody here looks in the mirror, right? Yeah. Guy or girl. <laughs> right? You might be looking in the mirror to dye yourself up. You look in the mirror and you might... I don't know about today. But when you look at the mirror... The person that you're looking at is the success side of you. You need to just think and believe that I can get where I want to be if I believe. But I, you got to want it. Babe Ruth gets up. He wanted to hit a home run. And there's thousands of success stories like this. You ever see the guy with no arms and no legs? Wojcik? Is he advantaged or disadvantaged? In some aspects, advantaged because he's got a deep dig, like, dig real deep within himself to get that out of there. there is, right. There's nothing. He has no disadvantage. Here's a guy that was born with no arms, no legs, no, he has no limbs. Play soccer, swims. If you ever get a chance to see this guy, I can guarantee you he will bring you to tears. He's that motivational. Because he can take what he doesn't have, never think about it, never let it alter his path in life. He's happy in spite of it. We all have that potential to get to where we want to be if we believe and if you want it and understand 
that no matter what happens in life, life will change in an instant, but you can change your life in an instant as well. You can get there. You're on a mountain all by yourself. Get off the mountain. You understand what I'm saying? But don't let it happen. <laughs> you don't need to crash the plane to get off the mountain. Start thinking today about how you're going to get off the mountain. The mountain that you are on. The mountain that you are on. The mountain that you are on. Get off the mountain. For those of you who want to climb the mountain, start to climb. Just look at the three feet in front of you. Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs>